You clicked on this video because I promised to show you the sound of an old Tascam 424 cassette Porta Studio. Well, here it is. What you're hearing is a test tone, really a test chord that I created using the tone generator in Audacity. I simply recorded that test sound into this device and then uh, played it out of the device through one of these track outs, recorded that sound with an audio interface back into my computer, and voila. But what, if anything, are you really hearing and why should you care? Those are the questions I hope to answer in this video and thus to give a real and maybe even meaningful explanation of the sound of cassette recording. First, let me explain to you why I'm even doing this. I've been working on a recording project using the 424. I've got like a little EP that I'm trying to build and until last week, the project had been going really well, but I hit a snag. Really, a sound, a sound that I didn't like that seemed to be coming from the 424. So I sat down and thought deeply about how I was going to troubleshoot this problem. Just kidding, I just sort of griped about it in a YouTube video and then put that out into the world. And I got some really useful feedback from folks who participate in this channel, including one comment that recommended that I basically run like a diagnostic on the channels on this 424. So I sort of took that idea and ran with it. I decided that the best thing to do would be to record some sort of baseline sound a really long sound, a sound that I could record for the entire duration of one of the Type 2 cassettes that I'm using. I wanted that sound to be pretty simple and honestly static because the point of recording the sound was not to like listen to variations in the sound, but to listen to variations or other weirdness that might have been introduced in the process of recording with the 424. To make that test sound, I sat down at my computer and I opened up Audacity. Yes, I do actually know how to use a DAW. And I use this one to create a few sounds sine waves, six sine waves in fact, corresponding with each of the pitches that you would hear if you strummed an open E chord on a guitar. Each of those sine waves was 22 minutes long and I mixed them down into one test chord. to record using my 424. And a few nights ago, that's exactly what I did. I rigged up this bizarre four-way splitter using a headphone amplifier that I have. That allowed me to play back this 22-minute test chord one time, but record the sound of that chord in each of the four channels and each of the four tracks on the 424. I got everything plugged in. I set the controls on each of the channels identically, armed the tracks to record and hit record. And then I connected the tape outputs on this device to the inputs on a Focusrite audio interface and recorded the tape sound back into the digital world. Now the point of all this was to listen back to the sounds that had been recorded with this device and to see what they sounded like compared to the original test chord that I had created. My goal was to try to identify or confirm really whether specific channels on this 424 had issues. And I found what I was looking for, but I was also able to make some more general observations about the sound of recording to cassette tape, at least when you're recording through a device like this one. And then I went on a little rant just to explain in the end that I focused the rest of my analysis on one of the four tracks that I had recorded out of the 424. It was track number two, the track that had been giving me problems in my session. So I started by listening to the recording from that track, track number two, and sort of A, being it against the original test chord that I created. And as I compared those sounds, I did notice a few things, like obviously tape hiss that was present on the track that had been recorded to tape. Track two did have some of the pitch wobble that I had been experiencing in my real recording project. Though honestly, not as much as I was getting in that project, and I don't yet know why. And about 13 minutes into the recording, it started exhibiting this sort of like popping sound that was actually a problem on this specific track in a prior recording project that I did with this device. 
while I care about those things, they probably mean very little to you. You're probably more interested in like, how did the two sounds compare to each other? And I'll say, as I listened back, it was obvious that there was some difference between the sounds, but I don't know if I would trust myself to describe those differences to you without resorting to a bunch of buzzwords that might be meaningless and certainly are subjective. So I decided to do something that's much more reliable, and that is to use the plot spectrum analyzer tool in Audacity to create a visual representation of the sound of the original chord and the sound of that chord having been recorded through track two of the 424. And that's where things really got interesting. Now, you have to be careful when comparing these two graphs because their axes are actually different, but I think it's obvious on the surface that these are different sounds. The most obvious differences are things present in the sound from the 424 that are not present in the original. First, you've got a little bump over at 19K or 20K. And then after the last peak in the main waveform, there's a much more gradual slope towards silence. Whereas in the original, it just sort of like drops off like a cliff. At first, I was pretty excited about those differences, but on further reflection, I actually don't think they're that important because those extra frequencies simply aren't that loud compared to the peaks, which represent the, the pitches, the fundamentals of my original test chord. So I thought I would zero in on those peaks and let the graph tell me how those pitch peaks relate to each other in terms of volume. And in the original test chord, I found that the peaks were at almost identical volumes. There was very by no more than a tenth of a decibel. And that's really no surprise because the original chord is a combination of six sine waves that were at equal volumes. But then the details of the sound that had been recorded to tape were a little bit more surprising. It's hard to match levels perfectly, but if it was a perfect one-to-one -one recreation of the original sound, you would expect the relationship between those peaks in terms of their volume to be the same, meaning that they would all have basically the same volume. And they didn't. The peak volume spanned a range of three and a half decibels from minus 29.2 dB all the way to minus 25.7 dB. Three and a half decibels is kind of a lot. It's the type of difference that the average human can detect. And I think that's really interesting. I mean, how many times have people said into the air or online that it sounds different when you record to tape. This could demonstrate that. The differences aren't gigantic, but they could be noticeable. And those differences occurred in what was really a relatively narrow range of frequencies. If I played an open E chord on this guitar, I would get a much wider range of frequencies, mostly because of the overtones that are produced by these strings. And this test chord didn't include anything like those overtones. I mean, it really just falls off after the last fundamental. But it whetted my appetite so I decided to do another test. This time I created the test chord that you heard at the start of this video. It doesn't sound nearly as nice, but it is much better for performing this test because it includes eight different sine waves that cover a much wider range of frequencies, all the way from 100 hertz on the low end to 15,000 hertz on the upper end. And with that revised test chord, I performed the same exercise. Well, sort of, I didn't record it to all of the channels. This time I just focused on the naughty channel two. I recorded it and played it back into the digital domain. And what did I find? Even bigger differences. Here are the plot spectrums, you can look at them for yourself, but I immediately zoomed back in on the peaks. And as before, the peaks in my test chord were at very, very similar volumes. In fact, all but one of them were at exactly the same volume level, the volume of the 15K tone was six tenths of a decibel lower for reasons I, I can't understand. But that difference is minor compared to what I observed in the track that had cassette mojo. I actually observed less volume variation in the range of the original sound, though there weren't nearly as many data points in that range. What's far more interesting is that somewhere between 1K and 2.5K, the volumes start to fall off. The 1K peak was at minus 25.4 decibels, and by 2.5K, it had dropped to minus 27.9 decibels. That's a change of 2.5 dB, and then it continued to drop from there, down to minus 32 at 5K, minus 35.4 at 10K, and minus 39.2 at 15K. 
That's almost 14 decibels of roll off between 1K and 15K. 10 decibels of roll off between 1K and 10K. That's a big change in a range of frequencies that are definitely audible, and it's a difference that definitely would be noticeable. And bear in mind that I did all of this testing with a Type 2 tape, which is the kind of tape that you're supposed to use with these devices. It's pretty common knowledge that there's a lot of high frequency roll off when you're using a Type 1 tape. There was a lot of roll off here too. And whether you consider it a loss of fidelity or tape mojo, it is definitely a thing. And at least to me, it suggests pretty clearly that you will get a different sound if you're recording with a device like this than if you're recording with a modern digital device. Because some combination of these elements is remixing your sound. Now, obviously remixing isn't the right term, but I hope you get my point. It does sound different. This, I think, proves it. And to me, the sound is good. Let me know what you think in the comments. And as always, thank you so much for your time. Take care of yourselves, and I'll see you around.